Good morning. I'm Jennifer Nicholson with Oracle, and I want to welcome you to the J Champions Conference, which is organized by Java Champions with all Java Champion speakers. Over four days of sessions on January 13th and 14th and 18th and 19th, you will hear from 28 different Java Champions. So who are these Java Champions? Well, they are a select group of over 300 technical luminaries who are leaders in the Java community. You can find a list of Java champions and learn more about the award at developer.oracle.com slash Java champions. So thank you for being a part of the first J Champions Conference and for your partnership in making Java the number one programming language and development platform in the world as we continue to celebrate its 25th anniversary. Now grab your favorite beverage, get comfortable, and enjoy one or all of these 24 different informative sessions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I guess we're live. Um, this is the uh, Looming uh, session by Kai Horsman. Looming changes in concurrent programming. So, uh, well, Kai does not need an introduction. Uh, and so, Kai, that's your uh, stage. Well, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Kai Horstman. Um, I am the author of Core Java um, and a whole bunch of other books that some of you may be familiar with. Um, so Java is now 25 years old. In fact, uh, my co-author at the time, Gary Cornell, and myself have been at this since 1996. And I still remember the day when uh, it was in 1995 when Gary called me up and said, Kai, we're going to write a Java book. And I said, Gary, you don't know Java, and neither do I. And so that was true. But he got a contract. So we had to learn it in a hurry. And ever since, I've been tirelessly updating um, uh, this book, which uh, when books were still printed on paper was a two-volume box set. And now it's all digital. And I'm working on the 12th edition right now, which should appear when JDK 17, the long-term release, is going to be out. And of course, I'm, going, I'm looking at all of the things that are coming up in the future, such as changes in concurrency with Project Loom. So Project Loom is all about rethinking uh, the way that uh, programming with threads is supposed to be done. And so it uses um, very a form of lightweight threads um, called sometimes fibers, or these days virtual threads. I'll be using both terms for a while. Um, and the idea is that normally when you have a thread and you block on the thread, you know, that means the thread can no longer proceed. And you have a finite number of threads. So now you have one fewer than you had before. With fibers, you can have so many of them that you don't worry about the fact that when you block, that you block a fiber. So you could, in theory, have millions. I don't know why one would ever actually want to have millions. Um, I'll show you that you can, in theory, have one. But don't, don't get hung up on the millions. You can have a lot of them. And you can have enough of them that you just don't worry if one of them blocks. Um, there's a charming API um, that, uh, for better or worse, looks just like the Java Lang thread API that we've all come uh, to love or not over the last 25 years, and the Java Util concurrent API. So the advantage is it's a familiar API, as you will see soon. The disadvantage is it's the familiar API that maybe is not the greatest. Um, the real motivation behind uh, Loom is that it no longer gives us icky async. Um, so for many programmers, dealing with async is a true pain. And uh, as we'll see with Loom, um, it should take away a lot of that pain. Uh, there's a cost to that, of course, and we'll talk about that. Um, the other aspect is that Loom tries to make it easier for you, although it won't require you, to use what's called structured concurrency. Um, where you structure your tasks in a way that makes it possible to reason about them. No more go to with threads. So will it make concurrency easy again? We'll see. And then how should we teach that stuff? I'll, I'll, I, I write these books for people to learn. And so I'm always wondering, you know, how should one learn this material? How should one uh, approach concurrency? And how should one teach it? Um, all right, so let's review a little bit concurrency on the Java platform. In 1995, 
it was amazing that the Java language had thread support built in. Uh, if you look at other languages that were there at the time, C or C++, they had libraries for threading, but it was not baked into the language. In Java, java.lang.object has methods, uh, wait and notify, and uh, has synchronized. Uh, so every object is a monitor. So it was baked into the language itself. Um, in 1997, um, I remember seeing the Java web server at the time, uh, which you know, nowadays has turned into Tomcat, and it ran each web request in a new thread instead of like it was done before, a new process. It, you could run thousands of concurrent requests in 1997. That was totally amazing. Nowadays, of course, it's not, but it wasn't. Um, in Java uh, 5 in 2004, we got Java Util Concurrent and got a new, uh, a whole uh, huge new API for dealing with concurrent programming. On the right, you can see the cover of Brian Gutz's excellent book on Java concurrency in practice that tries to explain to programmers how to actually do concurrent programming. So uh, we got uh, reentrant lock, concurrent hash map, executor, future. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this. In 2008, Java 8 gave us parallel streams, uh, which is a, another way of doing concurrent programming, and completable futures, which is a way of dealing with asynchronous programming. So what's uh, the deal with Loom? So the basic premise of Loom is that threads are expensive. And we know threads are expensive, otherwise we wouldn't have thread pools and things. But so you have one of these expensive threads and now you're gonna be doing an operation where the uh, thread blocks and now you have one fewer. If you have a few hundred concurrent requests and they all block, which they may well in a typical uh, kind of web scenario, then you have no more threads left. So that's no good. Um, so we avoid blocking at all costs I would say, we don't want to block. We want to make it so that all of our APIs are asynchronous that we'll just, in each thread, we'll say, yeah, go ahead and do this thing and call me back when the answer is available. Um, so then you program with callbacks and say, when the answer is available, then execute that piece of call, uh, that code, and then that piece of code does another asynchronous call and you have a callback and a callback and it gives you callback help and it's not a lot of fun. So there is an API for that with futures um, where you can, instead of having callbacks and set callbacks, you can have these futures um, where you have a future and then another and then another. And so what basically you do is you take all your program logic that normally you express with uh, things like uh, one statement after another or loops or calls or something, and you turn them into these method calls and futures, and it's pretty limiting and it's uh, not attractive. Other languages such as JavaScript give us async await that uh, kind of uh, rewrite your code into futures. Um, you get to uh, write it with async await. You have the illusion of having uh, normal control flow, um, but of course you don't quite have it. The difficulty with that is that when you have a function or a method that uses uh, await, then you can't, it, it's not a regular method. It's, uh, it's, it's an asynchronous method, and your entire API splits into two parts, the ones that are async and the ones that are not. So Loom wants to resync that. Rather than adding an, an async await to Java and making asynchronous programming more powerful, Loom just goes back and said, well, the root of all of this async stuff was that blocking is expensive, and what if blocking wasn't expensive? Um, so Loom gives you fibers. Um, that run on a carrier thread. Um, and there could be millions of them, but like I said, don't get hang up, hung up on it. So the point is that each thread runs multiple fibers and creating and switching between these fibers is cheap and blocking is essentially free. So when a, one of these fibers runs up against the block, then the uh, <coughs> runtime system will park it and will run another fiber on the carrier thread, and all of this is transparent to programmers. So will that make concurrency easy again? Well, um, it's always the case, of course, when something shiny and new comes along, 
that the first uh, thought is, oh, that's going to be the silver bullet that's going to fix everything. Um, and so it's not quite like that. So there's more than one reason why we do concurrent programming. So think of one classical reason, um, user interfaces. I know we no longer write many user interfaces, but just put yourself back into that state of mind. Um, in the olden days of Swing, um, we had to, to worry about uh, concurrency because the UI components are not thread safe um, by design. It's too complex to do that. And so you use a single UI thread to serialize operations on the UI. So whenever you want to do a long running task, then you have to make that, that, that the long running task uh, periodically calls into the UI thread and the UI thread only executes one thing at a time. Fibers want do anything at all there for you. So if you do that kind of programming, say on Android, you would still use you know, good old async task, or if you're actually still working on Swing, you would use the good old Swing worker. Well, what about parallel streams? Remember Java 8 came along and uh, we were told, you know, uh, now we can run these operations on uh, in parallel simply by taking a stream and adding parallel in it. And it makes concurrency so easy, so automatic. And so the, at the time, it was the shiny new thing. And lots of people said, oh, I'll well, have the state of structure. I'll just do call dot parallel. And automatically, I'm now going to get eightfold performance. And of course, that's not true again, not, not true at all. Parallel uh, streams work great for non-blocking workloads. So for workloads that do a whole lot of work, if they block, they uh, th things can be quite terrible because you then consume valuable screens, uh, valuable threads from the fork join pool. And it only works great if the data structure that you work on is splittable. So if you have a huge array, it's easy enough for the parallel stream to chop the array up into eight or 16 pieces and to run eight or 16 threads on those pieces. If your data structure is something else, say a bunch of directories that you read in from the file system, then uh, parallel streams don't buy you much at all. So parallel streams are not a silver bullet. They're great for when they apply, but they're uh, definitely not a universal solution. And neither are, uh, is Loom. So when you have these fibers, they add really no value whatsoever for computationally intensive tasks. If you have a task that consumes an entire core, you know, that does whatever, cryptography or uh, some AI uh, computations, then the, you don't want to have millions of them. You want to have eight of them if you have eight cores or 16 of them if you have 16 cores. And fibers are not at all the right thing. Fibers have a single sweet spot that if you have many more tasks, then you would want to allocate threads. Where many doesn't necessarily mean millions, but you know, maybe thousands. So you have more tasks uh, than potentially you have threads. And those tasks mostly block. So um, that is the sweet spot. So the theory is, well, how many threads do you actually want? Um, ideally, you want one thread uh, per core. And so you want eight or 16 threads. And if they can execute you know, thousands of fibers, that seems like a potentially good model. So that's the model that we're going to be examining to see uh, what, how it works, what the advantages are, and wh when you might want to use it and when you might not. So these tasks that, that uh, <coughs> we want to run will run in a fiber. And so I, I like the name fiber. I thought it was kind of intuitive. You know, the thread is made up out of fibers. But as it turns out that there uh, are other uses of the term fiber. So recently, the Loom team, sadly, has turned to the name virtual thread. So it's uh, these kind of lightweight threads are now virtual threads. The virtual threads are, of course, mapped onto real regular operating system threads. Every operating system thread will run a virtual thread until that virtual thread starts blocking. Then it'll switch to another and another and so on. And now, if you remember your history, in Java 
we already had a thing like that. It was called green threads at the time. And where uh, threads were run on you know, multiple uh, user level threads were run on an operating system thread by the Java runtime. Um, but it's not quite the same because when a green thread blocked, it blocked the carrier thread. So that's not at all what Loom is all about. Loom is all about throwing out a virtual thread or a fiber when it blocks and then running another one on the carrier thread. So now to harp again on the name a little bit, naming is hard as we know. So originally they were called lightweight threads or fibers. You know, like I said, I like fibers. Lots of fibers make a thread. And, you know, it of course explains the name Loom very nicely. Um, and there was at the time a different API for fibers and for threads because, you know, they're somewhat different. But as uh, the Loom team experimented with this, they felt that most people kind of didn't really want to have a new API. The fiber API converged to the thread API. Um, and also, what, what do you call these things? Lightweight or new is not so great because you know, surely something newer will come along and then new sounds pretty stupid and maybe something lighter weight could come along. And so they said virtual. Now, why virtual? So the idea is that a virtual thread is kind of mapped onto a real thread, just like virtual memory is mapped to actual RAM memory. Um, so that's what you're supposed to think about when you think virtual. Now, I don't really think about virtual memory a lot. All the memory is virtual, but that's, that's what comes from. Do not think virtual function. So that was my first idea when I heard virtual threads. I somehow thought you know, virtual functions and uh, dynamic dispatch has nothing to do with that at all. So virtual is also not a great word, maybe because it's so overloaded. Like I said, naming is hard. So let's have a peek at the API as it exists today. Um, everything that I say you know, is likely going to change five times around. Um, this API has changed multiple times, but it's, uh, it's a good idea to look at something concrete. So if you want to start a new virtual thread, there is a convenience method, uh, thread.startvirtualthread. You give it a runnable, and it's already started. And uh, there it runs. Um, what's it good for? Or for demos. So if someone wants to give a quick demo, they just run it. And so what you get is you get a thread. Notice that a virtual thread is a thread in the current version of this API. It has all of the methods that a regular old thread has, some of which make more sense than others. There's a, a, another way of getting virtual threads is with a builder API. Um, you call the static method thread.builder that gives you a builder object, then you configure it. I want this thread to be virtual. I want it to have this name. I want it to have this task. Then I build it. At this point, I have a thread, and then I still need to start it. Um, so that's a more traditional way of doing it. But wait a minute, uh, why are you constructing your own thread? You're not supposed to construct your own threads uh, in uh, <clears throat> Uh, 2021, um, you should use an executor, of course. So let's do that with an executor service instead. So, and you do that the exact same way that uh, everyone already knows ever since Java 5. You make an executor service, um, and so you used to make that by calling executors new cache thread pool, new fixed thread pool, and now we're calling new virtual thread executor, and it gives us virtual threads. Now, when I submit a task to it, then it runs on a virtual thread. Um, and when I give it a callable, then it also runs on a virtual thread. And it gives me a future for the result, exactly like it's always worked in Java Util Concurrent. So that is an attractive part of the API that you don't really have to rethink um, anything. If you know regular threads and executors, you can deal with virtual threads. You simply put new virtual thread executor, and you're done. So if you wanted to, you could use a thread factory to custom customize. So here I have an example where I'm using that builder thing again. I say I want virtual threads. I want the names to start with my factory starting at one. And then the dot factory gives me a thread factory. And then I can just put it uh, into the executor. Um, if you want to scratch your head and uh, to try to figure out what this thing would do. So here I'm using a uh, new cached thread pool, and I'm giving that my fa my factory. This is, of course, a really terrible idea. 
um, you do not want to mix cache thread pools. Uh, you don't want to ha have, have that uh, with virtual threads. Um, and you can think about why. So when you operate with virtual threads, you certainly want to just use the new virtual thread executor. So let's kick the tires. Um, you can do this uh, on your own. There is now pre-built binaries. They get updated pretty frequently. Um, used to be able to build them from source, but no longer. Um, every few weeks, a new one comes along. And it's easy enough to just run a million fibers. Not that this is a good idea, but you can. Um, you know, here I'm making my virtual thread executor, and I just submit a million fibers. Um, so in the example that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, just sleeping. What, what else can I do a million times? Um, and this will actually work. I can demo it. So let me get the, the complete code here. So you see I'm doing this a million times. Um, yeah, and task is a million. Um, submitting this thing. Um, and let's just do this real quick here. Hello, Kai? Kai? I think we lost Kai for some networking issue. Yep, seems to be gone. So <clears throat> let's give him uh, maybe a couple of minutes to uh, figure this out. Yeah, Anthony, it could be exactly that. <laughs> it could be that trying to create a million virtual thread crashed. <laughs> His computer. Evo comments, this is the demo effect. Indeed, it is. It always happens, so. So meanwhile, I'll try to entertain the audience here. So can you speak up if you have already tried the Loom or downloaded the binaries and, you know, tried it? and see if it works for your case. Uh, please put a comment and uh, let's see if this rough poll gives us a good number. I did. So since we're waiting for Kai still, I'll try to answer a couple of questions that pop up here. So one is um, from which JDK onwards uh, Loom is supported and uh, there's currently uh, builds uh, based on JDK 16. 
and uh, it is still an experimental project is not going to be uh, introduced by default, I imagine, in JDK 17, because uh, JDK 17 is a long-term support release. And therefore, I doubt that uh, Loom will be introduced uh, because um, 17 is supposed to be a stable release uh, and you don't want this many changes to uh, be in there. Um, there's another interesting comment about, um, I heard about Loom, but I was afraid to use it in practice. And uh, I would love to uh, hear what you were afraid of, and uh, because that's, that's a very interesting comment, uh, whether, uh, you know, relates to the stability of the uh, project, which is, again, currently um, experimental. Um, but, um, uh, or whether it's um, the API or the concepts that it brings into, into the Java world that worry you. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, Kai seems to have disappeared now. It's been quite a while, but let me try to contact him uh, and see if I can get a handle of him. And um, Okay, I sent him a, an old technology SMS. Let's uh, uh, Ken. Hello, um, I sent an SMS to uh, Kai. Kai. Uh, let's see if he replies. Um, but for now, there's we're waiting for him to rejoin. Uh, Ken, can you can you please tell me whether we have additional time past nine o'clock uh, European time? Let's say past uh, would be three o'clock east, uh, which is supposedly the end of the session. Thank you. 
Wow, uh, I should have, I should have um, brought in some kind of. Uh, I still have no answer from Kai, um, so I really don't know what what to what to do. But um, well, let's uh, since your guys are here, let's try to entertain. Uh, so there's a question directly to me. Uh, what did I use uh, Project Loom for? So. Um, I didn't want to do this because this was Kai presentation, but let's wait for him. So I am uh, working on the Jetty uh, project. I'm one of the project leader for the Jetty project. And we have recently tried uh, Loom and benchmarked it a little bit and tried to uh, see how Loom was uh, working within Jetty. Uh, we have published a couple of blogs that you can find on uh, webtide.com, which is the company behind Jetty that is providing commercial support for Jetty. And you can read all our um, experiments and results in those blogs. Um, and that's uh, what we use the Loom for. The idea was uh, looks interesting, technology looks interesting. And so we wanted to um, you know, give it a go uh, early and report feedback and uh, that's what happened um, following those two blogs there has been a discussion on the loom dev uh, mailing list uh, under the open jdk project uh, and uh, yeah it's been so far i, I would say constructive uh, heated discussion maybe but um, you know it's uh it's usual when the technology is could be a game changer and um, and you know people have strong opinions so um you know i think it's been a, a healthy debate about and uh, but of course you know loom is experimental and there's a lot of performance improvements that you know the core loom team can do to make it uh, even more efficient and um, and everything so it's good. So let me just uh, go back here to. Again, um, just for entertainment, um, did we test it with big string objects? Um, it's orthogonal. It, it has no impact whatsoever on loom or traditional threads. It's not uh, something that has any problem or loom has any problem with. I mean, it's an orthogonal feature um, that is not impacted by big string objects or the, the heap in general. Although Loom has impacts on the heap, but uh, again, that's uh, currently one of the things that the core Loom team is working on. Uh, but whether your application allocates big objects is irrelevant. Uh, Harry, um, the conclusion was the Loom was taking a lot of memory. Uh, the conclusion to what? Uh, did you, I missed maybe some context that you were talking about? Maybe can you explain in the comments? So the input stream and output stream uh, question by Mazud is, um, Again, it's uh, orthogonal. It's uh, not the loom changes the way that you allocate memory or you save memory. It's, it's uh, again, uh, an orthogonal issue. So 
if you are using an input stream to read a lot of data and uh, you buffer that data into memory and um, you know you continuously read 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 for example you read like a full two gigabyte movie well you will have uh, and you buffer it in memory rather than maybe writing chunks on disk well if you buffer it in memory you're going to have a two gigabyte array memory and uh, it is going to be a two gigabyte array whether you use uh, virtual threads or native threads it's it's the same the difference in uh, the loom gives you is the following that when you read or write to an input stream and it blocks then um, you uh, loom doesn't block the carrier thread and so that carrier thread can be used to run other tasks uh, Henri I see you on let me add you uh, since we are <laughs> happily chatting uh, this has become like a bar chat hello Henri hello how are you yeah Good. since we need to entertain uh, the crowd a little bit uh, I thought I would ask my questions directly from inside um, no no because for for those who haven't read the the, the blog post and uh, like JT trying to play with loom it's extremely interesting so I highly suggest that. I don't remember if you wrote it or someone else actually. But it was a work that we did together with uh, Greg Wilkins and, and I. I mean, it, it, we set up the things and then we discussed the outputs and then we made a few runs and then we started writing the blogs. Greg uh, did most of the work, but um, uh, as usual, when you do this kind of work, you need a sparring partner to question your work and say, are you really doing the right thing? Is this test really a test where you compare apples to apples between virtual thread and native thread? Because it's very easy to came up with a use case that kills Loom in one case or came up with another test case that kills native threads and makes Loom completely shine. And so, you know, of course, we are biased in a way that our domain is the one of a servlet container in web applications. And so we think, how can we leverage Loom for our use case? But, and so, yeah, it was, a, I would say, like a joint effort between Greg and I and other web tied um, employees that, uh, you know, try to make the test as fair as possible <laughs> but then it's an interesting use case because we do a lot of application servers uh, trying to serve as many requests as possible so that's one of the main things java is doing i would say and uh, and so so my when reading it my conclusion was that since we're creating a lot of mm, fibers of virtual threads we are allocating tons of things, uh, which include stack space, I think, plus, as you said, streams and things. So it actually can be harmful. That's what I remember. And then you get performance that are maybe equivalent to normal pooling of threading, but but with more memory use. So, so that that's what my, my, my personal conclusion after reading it. So. Uh, so uh, to be more precise, it's um, it's a twofold thing, right? So, when you run native threads, uh, they their stack, the, the space for their stack is allocated in native memory, and so it doesn't show up in the heap. Therefore, you can use the heap uh, as much as you want for your application. However, you, you the process, the JVM process, still has a lot of memory allocated, but in the native space. Mm -hmm. So, and that's one thing. That's why, for example, you cannot create a million native threads because typically the computers typically don't have enough memory uh, to, to, to do that. On the other hand, uh, a virtual thread is, uh, the memory that a virtual thread occupies depends on the depth of the stack trace. 
So if you do a very simple loop where you create a runnable on the fly that just does a print a number, yeah. the stack trace of that runnable is very short because it is the virtual thread calling your Lambda, that's it. It's probably two or three frames, which is not a lot. If you compare the normal web application that goes through Spring and Spring Security and Spring Proxies and, and whatnot, it's easy to go to a stack frames that are, you know, 500 uh, frames deep. And that will occupy memory. Now, in the heap currently. Now, when discussing this with uh, Ron Pressler, which is the Loom uh, head, uh, project leader, uh, he said, well, I consider this, if, if the Loom metadata affect somehow the garbage collection of your application, et cetera, et cetera, well, I consider that to be something that is not optimal or even a bug. And therefore, they are looking into different ways of maybe mapping that metadata so that it will be cheap and it will not affect applications. Again, it's it's in a way it's good that we have done this benchmark because uh, you know we, we we have at least raised an issue which will make the loom. Uh, I'm sure they were aware of ready, but you know, at least they have one more person saying, hey, what about very long and, and deep uh, stack traces? And you know, the argument, oh, these are not really common. It's not true yeah. because, yeah, exactly. Spring especially. Yeah, Spring uh, is fairly long by itself, yeah. yeah. Produces a very long thing, but but I've seen even for applications that don't use Spring, I've seen, uh, for example, uh, enterprise applications that have maybe 20, 30 uh, servlet filters that do all kind of uh, modifications to the request and the response. So uh, you, you know, with 30 filters, you do have a long uh, and a very deep uh, stack trace when you eventually land on your uh, application code. So, um, I'm so thing to think we lost him forever, <laughs> but but that's interesting, nevertheless, because um, but and the loom, the loom. Uh, use case main use case was to be used by application servers like jetty theoretically or they, they were thinking about other use cases more important you know it's hard to say uh, i don't think loom was born to help somehow containers uh, or you know server containers uh, i don't think that was the main case um the main case was much more general. It's like, well, if you're going to block either on I/O or a, or on a contended lock, it's you know you can lock, you can set aside your uh, yeah. virtual thread at that point and use the carrier thread to do something else. This is actually exactly the same model that you have when you do. Uh, uh, asynchronous programming using callbacks. Mm -hmm. What happens is that the callback captures the current state of the application rather than the stack frames, but just the state of the application, so variables and, and whatnot, and code. And um, you return from the callback, and that thread fundamentally goes back into the thread pool. And then it can be used from the thread pool to do something else. So the model is very similar. What is the big difference? Big, big difference. And it is the super killer feature that Loom introduces, which I'm sure Kai was talking about. The big difference is that Loom would allow you to have an API that is completely synchronous, which is super simple. You read from top to bottom. There's no callbacks. Mm -hmm. And it is super simple. We actually uh, kind of, and let me use the word measure that uh, in, in the comedy, well, in the test that we made and we blogged about. And I can tell you this, the transport that I, the blocking transport that I was uh, using to compare Loom um, was probably 20 lines of code, something like that. 
the asynchronous transport that you can write using asynchronous I.O. with the serverless three one model, et cetera, was probably 10 times more, let's say 200 lines, but probably really? even more than that, okay? So that's where Loom would really be the killer feature. It would be, well, if I can write exactly the same code, which perform it in the same way, well, functionally exactly the same code, right? So it does the same thing in 20 lines of code rather than in 200s. Well, you know, it's bug saved, uh, you know, super simple to understand, super simple to reason about. And, uh, you know, all the, uh, the big work is being done by Loom and I'm happy with that. Um, is that the future of Java APIs? Meaning, uh, you know, we're never going to see an API that returns a completable future ever. Well, uh, well, there are cases where maybe I would like a completable future uh, out of it for, you know, for some reason. Uh, maybe I'm familiar with this style of coding maybe I have to integrate with other libraries that have not been, uh, you know, decided to go and, you know, eat the red pill and say, oh, we're not going to write anything asynchronous anymore because by the time Java 25 exits, Loom will be integrated and therefore any new library, I'm just saying a uh, number, and the new libraries uh, that will, you know, be applied to futures version of Java will not need to be asynchronous or return a completable future. Well, uh, you know, Java has a long history of backwards compatibility in a way. So, you know, it's going to be like a really long time before you can say, well, okay, uh, Loom was really a great idea. Let's convert everything to Loom. And uh, now we're, you know, writing super simple code that has a good performance. It's difficult. So, <clears throat> sounds like a far future. Uh, I'll be curious if they're able to use it for parallel streams, implementations, and things like that. So under the hood, if it could be, uh, if it's actually useful. So this is something that Kai mentioned uh, in the slides that he was able to actually uh, produce. Um, that's not the sweet spot of uh, Loom. So if you have a parallel stream, uh, it is because you have something that just runs in memory and runs the CPU at Not full true. speed. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, having eight virtual thread on top of eight carrier threads doing the work is exactly the same as having eight carrier threads that do the work. So that's not Loom sweet spot. You can do it, but it's an unfair example, I would say. It's it's not something that puts Loom into its best use case. Uh, there's nothing preventing you from parallel stream to, I don't know, do a uh, internet grabber that just does IOs all over the place and it does it in parallel. Of course, right now it will block the common pool, which is bad, but it doesn't kind of, it is possible. <laughs> But you say, for example, for web, sp uh, web spider? Uh, like if you do a, a web crawler or something like yes. that, that it will do tons of IO, and I could just parallel stream that to, to just make it work. And then the fork join pool behind will try to cope with that, which will freeze my entire application probably right now. But with Loom, it should fluently work and just do the job. Exactly. That's a very, that's a very, very good use case for Loom. It is exactly the sweet spot that Kai was talking about. Ah, there you go. He's back. Let's see. Ooh, cool. He's really back. Um, cool. Yeah, let me add him to the stream. Let him there and you can kick me out. Of <laughs> Kai, you're back on stream. Oh, yeah. So the last 21 minutes were just lost. The last, uh, I would say, half an hour. I okay, well, great. Okay, but well, then I, then I did guess... Did you we'll realize you were gone, or...? Well, the thing is, I kind of realized that I was gone, and then it started going again. And ah. then I, I, did, I didn't get your call until just now. So that is kind of annoying. I sent you an SMS. Did you receive it? Well, now I got it. Ah. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. Shit. <laughs> but yeah. you have time. You have time to so start so, back from where? Where so, were we? I don't know. Yeah. Well, we I don't know. Done? I mean, that that's well, that's kind of crud. Kai was trying to answer a few questions, and uh, we just uh, had a chat, a friendly chat, and then Harry uh, yeah. graciously joined here. So yeah. let's resume your uh, your thing. The last thing that we saw was uh, you trying to run the uh, million threads. Uh, right. right. And so is then what happened is that Loom did what it sometimes does. It crashed. Oh. <laughs> and it somehow <laughs> took something with it. And then it just, you know, it just hung the machine for about a minute. Oh, and right. then it came back, and so I have no idea what happened. Yeah, oh, we lost you. So, 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 so I kept talking for you know this entire oh, time. So that seems like right. a, that was then a complete waste. So I don't really know what we should do with this. Um, you, you, have, mean, you have time. You have time. So there's no need to, to be super quick. You can go over time. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just it, wondering. I mean, the, the the point is not so much for the people here, right? But it's for if we wanted to record this. Yes, but we can put in the YouTube stream uh, a comment and maybe pin it at the top that says uh, there has been an interruption between this minute and that minute, and so you can skip and then skip to the Ooh. video where we restart right now, and it will be good. So yeah. if you want to go, oh, okay. um, yeah, please do it. Yes, and we can okay. edit afterward if needed. Don't don't worry about that. Just just go ahead and. Yeah, okay. Well. Okay. That's kind of annoying. Um, so please resume. So I'll. Yeah. I'll be yeah. So did, so, so, yeah. Yeah. And so did, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess I'll just do that. What the heck? So let me go back to where I was. Um, so I was running. Just, just tell me where where I was. Right. So I uh, was. Hi. You oh. need to reshare your screen with your. Thank presentation. you. Yep. So and then I'm actually not going to run this because it's too dangerous. Um, I was wondering about that. See, that's why what, what Heinz Kabutz always does is he mm -hmm. runs those on a different machine. Ah, interesting. And yes, and that's definitely something you want to do. Um, and so next time I, <laughs> I will do that. Um, okay, let's see. How do I share the screen again? No, down here. Okay, you have the screen back? Yes, yeah. and there you go. Okay, let me find back to this spot where I was. This That's so about much. kick the tires. So, kick Bruh. the tires is good. So, I guess the next one. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, I, I'm just going to go ahead from here again, and I hope that someone can just snip out the piece in the middle or something um, and figure this out. That's the best I can do, I guess. All right. So um, it's easy enough for you to try out Loom. Um, you just download it. Um, there are frequent new versions available every few weeks. Uh, and if you so choose, you can run a million fibers. All you do is you make a loop, you make a new virtual thread executor, and you uh, just submit a million tasks to it, and they will all run. Um, if you just want to try something simple, you can have each of them sleep for some random amount, and then print something. Um, and that'll actually work. If you try the same thing with threads, then on my laptop, uh, I was out of memory after about 10,000 threads, which makes sense because threads consume real memory. So where are we this, with this project? Um, a huge part of Loom is to make the various parts of the Java API um, friendly for fibers. Um, Thread.sleep, of course, has to park a fiber. Java util concurrent locks, you know, reentrant lock, and so on, the same thing. This has been done. Um, and I know sockets are now uh, fiber friendly. When uh, one uh, blocks on a socket in a fiber, the fiber gets parked. 
Um, I don't know anything really about how TLS works, but apparently they had to do something to make it fiber friendly. And some of the re-implementations of this are already in JDK 11, 12, and 13. And that's a nice part about the, this rolling release model of Java that as this code for things like sockets or TLS was restructured, it just gets put when it's ready in one of these versions that it gets some amount uh, of uh, uh, use and uh, whatever uh, problems uh, are likely to appear sooner rather than later. And by the time that you put one of these long-term releases to use, then you're in good shape. Um, at this point, right today, um, blocking on monitors on you know the, the things with synchronized methods, those, those intrinsic monitors of every Java object does not yet park a Loom fiber. That's something that they need to work on. And for some reason, it's hard uh, because of some Java internals, but it'll happen. So there's work on uh, support for debugger, monitoring, JMX. Um, that, that kind of stuff, and it's ongoing work. It'll happen. Um, there are right now lots of instabilities. Um, in fact, um, I just ran a million fibers, and it managed to not just crash uh, the Java virtual machine, but uh, my computer. Um, this thing shouldn't happen, and they're working on it. It happens less and less. Uh, performance is also not where it should be. There's but. Um, that's also work in progress, and it'll only get better. So there's the APIs in constant flux. Um, you know, use it, give feedback. And of course, if there's something that uh, they, they need lots of uh, feedback on testing, if you can put this to work on something, that'd be great. So the other thing that Loom wants to offer us is structured concurrency. So if you have a chance to uh, look at the, this blog that I've linked uh, to here, so just you know, I'll go to the web version of the presentation and click on it. Now, read this blog article. It's a, it's a great read. Um, Nathaniel Smith says, um, if you think about it, if we launch a new thread you know, in, in Go or in Java, you know, where we say, you know, just start a thread, that's kind of like going off into outer space. Who knows what that thread is going to do? You could do anything, and you really don't have any great control over it. So it's like in the 1960s when uh, we had sequential control, which everyone understands. You do one thing and another and another, versus go to where you know, anything could happen. And in the 60s, we learned that go to is bad, and we shouldn't program with go to's, but we should use you know, branches, one left or the right, or loops. Um, or function calls, and that gave us structure in our program. So we could reason about them. So with concurrency, um, Smith says, you know, you should kind of do the same thing. Um, we should not wildly have tasks go off, but we should say, yeah, we'll run a bunch of tasks in parallel, and then we'll wait for them to all come back together. Um, yeah, that waiting will block, but in Loom, we don't care. Blocking is cheap. Um, and that gives us control over resource deallocation. We know that by the time we're at the point down here, resources get deallocated. Um, it gives us control over uh, cancellation. We can cancel all of these here because we don't have to worry that some task you know, goes off and spins off other tasks and much later spins off other tasks. We have complete control over the, the tree of tasks. The way it's done in Loom is simply by using the familiar executor interface. So when you have an executor, you give it tasks, and then you call close, then that operation blocks until all the tasks are done. That gives us the meeting at this point here. And remember, blocking is cheap in Loom. Um, it's convenient in, in the Java world by making the executor auto-closable. So here, I'm having my executor here. I'm giving it tasks, and I need, you don't even have to call close. The close is automatic because of the try with resources block. And implicitly, this statement here will execute all the tasks and block until they are completed. If you use callables, then you can use the familiar invoke any and invoke all. And your tasks get executed in parallel and the results get combined. One of them is taken, or you get all of them. Well, 
if your task does do some some kind of computation, it's one thing. But if normally when you have blocking tasks, there's a possibility of timeout, and that's also made easy. Um, you give a a deadline um, to the executor, and you say um, if it's executed longer than um, 30 seconds after the current time, then you want to be done. What does that mean? That means that all of these tasks here, they should be canceled. How do they get canceled? Well, they get canceled the same way they always get canceled in Java. So in Java, if you recall, you have cooperative cancellation. You can't stop a thread. I guess you can stop it, but you shouldn't. It's a deprecated method and it can do a harm. Um, and so you have to use interruption. By convention, when you interrupt a thread, it gets canceled. And that means when you implement the thread, um, you then have to, uh, every once in a while, check for the interrupted flag. And if it was interrupted, then you know that you should no longer proceed with working. Um, also, of course, you could get interrupted when you call a blocking method such as sleep or you know, any other blocking method, really. They throw interrupted exceptions. And so one way of structuring this is that you surround your entire uh, run method with uh, try and catch for the interrupted exception. Um, you clean up when you caught it and you leave um, <coughs> the, the runnable. Um, it's never been a lot of fun. It's certainly a great source of confusion for beginners because there's a number of different ways of arranging this code um, with, with you know, minor differences and it takes a while to get the hang of it. Um, but it's the Java way. Now, of course, for threads, it's not actually that wonderful. It's a poor match for thread pools. And what does it mean to interrupt a thread in a thread pool? That you just hate that thread and you never wanted to execute anything anymore? Um, you really want to interrupt tasks, not threads. So that's why Loom is much better. In Loom, you have a perfect match between a task and a virtual thread. Um, there's no sense of running more than one task on a virtual thread. And so you can interrupt the virtual thread, which means to interrupt the task. Also, in, in Java, um, so far, interruption is kind of inconsistent in the API. So invoke any, for example, on an executor service cancels all the remaining tasks, but com completable future any of, which kind of is the same way it does not. There's a reason for it, but it is definitely a source of confusion. Um, at one time, Loom said this whole thread interruption no, it was always an ugly API. We should clean it up. And so they had a nicer cancellation model. But then when they unified the API for fibers or virtual threads and threads, then that's fallen by the wayside. So we get to keep on uh, doing it the same way. We've done it for 25 years. So, um, and interrupting a virtual uh, thread that, that blocked is, is completely cheap. The thing is parked. And so there's essentially no cost for, for interrupting and unparking. it. And that's what's being used by executor service shutdown now or by the expired deadline interruption. So in that case, all of the tasks get interrupted the same old way. One pain point for Loom is thread locals. So remember what a thread local is. It's a variable that you, it's not global, but there's one copy per thread. There's a bit of ceremony to make one. Um, the easiest, uh, and I think easiest to understand way is the following, that you say, you make this thread local and you give it a lambda. And when it's called for the first time, then it's lazily initialized with that lambda. That happens once per thread. So one reason that people like to use thread locals is, um, for kind of globalish variables, but they want to have one per thread. Um, so here I have a connection, uh, like a database connection. I have my thread local. I say, get me the database connection. And the very first time it gets initialized. And the next time I just get the same one back. And so it's kind of gl uh, global on this thread um, without me having to pass it one function call uh, to the next. Um, it's, of course, tricky to get the stuff right with thread pools, as you can imagine, and uh, Stack Overflow is replete with uh, advice about that. Um, another reason to use this uh, that you sometimes find is people say, well, what about simple date format? It's not thread safe. But on a single thread, um, then, of course, you can serialize calls to, uh, to, to the format method. And so you could use thread locals to safely use that. 
Um, with virtual threads, that doesn't really work so well because if you have um, millions of uh, virtual threads, oh, never mind that you, know, you probably won't, but if you have large numbers of virtual threads, do you really want to have a simple date format for each of them? Do you really want to have a database connection for, for each of them? Probably not. Um, also, um, but people do right now, um, and so they just want to make their code lumified, and so they run into this issue. Um, it gets worse with inheritable or threat locals. They're very expensive to, uh, to deal with because um, thread locals, the bindings are mutable. And so that means that the thread local map needs to be copied from one uh, thread to its descendants. Um, and so if you do that large scale, that's a problem. So in Loom, they're messing with this. And they, first of all, say, well, wouldn't it be, be best if you used no thread locals? Um, and so in the builder, you can say, my uh, factory isn't going to use thread locals, or at least I'm not going to be using non, no inheritable thread locals. And if your code ends up doing, because you're combining it with a bunch of history code, then you just get an exception and you can, uh, you can trace that. Well, there are good reasons to use thread locals. So there's exploratory work on giving a lightweight equivalent to that that makes sense on loop. So um, if you have a bunch of threads in parallel and they all should access some, some uh, common structure, you could say, well, it's kind of a scope that uh, it's of course not a real scope because they all run away and uh, they're not in the same function scope or in the same class scope that you have in Java, but you say, no, it is kind of a scope. They should all be able to access the same data. And so you kind of may want to support it by just tying it to the executor. Um, for uh, low cost, the binding should be immutable and that handles most use cases. So here's an example on how they have proposed it um, and it actually worked like this uh, in, in a recent version of Loom, but not in the most recent. So we have a uh, lightweight thread local, um, and we bind it to whatever the value is that we, we want, This in this case, some database connection. Then we submit a bunch of tasks, and within the scope, all of these tasks can access this variable, this con, uh, the, 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 the <coughs> It's called TL variable. And when, when they access it, they all get um, the value. At the end of this try uh, with resources block, the binding goes away. And that's it. So it's kind of an orderly scoped kind of thing. Um, why don't they just tie it directly to the executor, which already gives you the scope? Well, they say there may be some other kind of context where this might set, make sense. So here I have a parallel stream. Um, it runs a bunch of tasks you know, on the state of structure in parallel. And maybe one also wants to give it a, uh, a scope binding. Like I said, this API is completely in flux. Um, don't take these particular slides too seriously, but uh, follow what it is that they're going to be doing with these thread locals. It's definitely something that they want to get working. Um, one example that I like to use to wrap my head around um, <clears throat> these issues comes from Heinz Kabutz. Um, so he gave this puzzler at, at the jQuery conference where it was something very simple. He loaded thousands of Dilbert cartoon images, one per day, as one does. And so for each image, one had to load um, this web page uh, with a date in it that has the image URL inside. One then loads the image URL, and then one, uh, one saves the image, displays it, whatever. And when he did it, he used computable, completable futures, the shiny new thing at the time, and it was a complete and utter mess. Here's what it looks like, uh, more or less. And there was a mistake in it, or there was an issue with it. He was using, the, at the time, new HTTP client, and there was um, it, it just didn't really work. And it was hard to find out why it didn't work, because the structure was just so obscured by this completable future mambo jumbo where um, <clears throat> it just became uh, hard to trace. So is that a good use of fibers? So I rewrote it with virtual threads. And the structure of the program got dramatically simplified because all I had to do 
is I made, uh, here I wanted to load 3,000 images. I took them from Wikimedia uh, instead of from Dilbert because the Dilbert site throttles you pretty quickly if you try to download a lot of images and it, it blacklists your IP address for a while. Um, Wikimedia nicely enough doesn't do that. So here I submit um, all of these, these tasks to 3,000 fibers. They all go on and uh, the code for lock doesn't do any callbacks. Um, it simply uses blocking reads. There's another blocking call to a semaphore because as it turns out, if you try to get uh, 3000 images at the same time from Wikimedia, um, it, it won't let you after the first 150 or so, it uh, uh, will refuse more concurrent requests as you can imagine. So I put in a semaphore to make sure that only 100 requests go through at a time. After the 101st, the semaphore blocks. I don't care, blocking is cheap. Then I make a blocking read to the page. Um, yeah, blocks, I don't care. I make a blocking read to the image and I still don't care. From a performance point of view, there's no win to use fibers. The gating factor to this is simply the number of concurrent requests that Wikimedia uh, lets me do. So I could have used a thread pool with 100 threads and the speed in which this whole thing had happened would be essentially the same. The advantage is with the programming model that I don't have to, to worry about how many there are. I, uh, when you size a thread pool, you know, it is a rough equivalent to sizing concurrent requests, but it's not exactly the same thing. Here I can with surgical precision say, I wanna have no more than 100 concurrent requests and also really no less. And so with the semaphore, that's really easy. I get exactly that. I don't get an approximation of that. And so, and each time that a call gets, there's no guilt. So I get a better programming model. And that's kind of where the advantage of Loom is. It's not necessarily that you can't do it any other way or that you, you know, want to have a god awful number of concurrent tasks. The programming model is where it's at. Now, the the folks who design uh, Jetty, they're dubious about some of the claims that Loom makes. So they say, and that makes a total sense, that if you have millions of virtual threads, they're going to consume really non-trivial resources. And those resources will be the gating factor that will really not allow you to have millions of threads in the first place. And you know, then what's the point? Then you might as well use maybe 10,000 real threads. But like I say, the programming model. So it's possible that in the future, there'll be a mixed approach where the people who implement something like Jetty, they will use kernel threads for the part that they understand and uh, they will use async programming for, for the internals. But maybe the user facing model will really be virtual threads. Don't worry about blocking, run, uh, uh, run things to the uh, level of parallelism that makes sense for your tasks. So this, uh, it's very attractive to say one virtual thread is one task that simplifies your mental model greatly. And that's what Loom gives you. So that brings me to this question, how do we actually teach concurrency? And so if we look at the, uh, the Java tutorials, uh, concurrency lessons, how do they do it? So this is for people who have never done anything with concurrent programming before. They, the tutorial starts out with thread.start and thread.sleep. It then goes to thread.interrupt. These people have never done any concurrency before. Interrupted exception, thread.join, race conditions, synchronized methods and synchronized blocks, volatile deadlocks, starvation and live locks, wait and notify all. This is so wrong. These are all the kinds of things that you do not want a novice programmer who has never done anything with concurrency at all to ever even use. You know, a novice programmer should think not of threads, but of tasks. And so what's a task? I mean, a task is, is a runnable. Uh, that's a task with a side effect. Or better, a task is a callable, something that delivers a result, hopefully not with us, uh, side effect. That's what we want to run. We want to run these tasks. So an executor executes these tasks. And so traditionally, yeah, it executes it on a thread pool, but with Loom, you know, it executes on these virtual threads, one virtual thread per task. Clear, clean mental model. 
And yeah, uh, with callables, of course, you get a future. Um, and to get the result of the future, you have to block. With Loom, you don't care, so it blocks. Um, of course, many times a task decomposes into subtask. And do you want to execute them concurrently? Um, yeah, if you want to keep your cores busy, but also if they keep a lot of time blocking and that's Loom sweet spot, then yeah, you just execute them concurrently and you wait until they're all done. So let's not get into cores busy uh, right now. You know, uh, cores busy gets you into parallel streams or fork join, but in the interest of Loom, you know, we're interested and we have a lot of tasks. They all go out somewhere in the internet, they do some stuff, they block, then they all come back and give us results and we want to combine. So that's where Loom comes in. It has an easy programming model. The best way I find of using it is you call it invoke all. Invoke all just uh, makes them all run and then you wait for the future that gives you the result. And that way, most programmers probably would not have to worry about async. Um, if that's what you kind of do, you do a bunch of stuff, uh, you wait for the answers to come in, you combine them, you give something back uh, as a result. Um, you know, why have to be tortured with async? That's the promise of Loom. So, um, of course, lots of things can go wrong with concurrent programming, and I had a slide for this that in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip. So, to summarize, um, as we know, Java is not done. With Java 17, the long-term uh, release will come soon. In three years, there'll be Java 23, and there'll be many more to come. And Java is alive and kicking. There's lots and lots of structural changes that get a lot of attention by very smart people. Um, and so when they do these things, they do very smart stuff. Um, it's not always clear that what they do, because they are so focused on the internals, um, is, is what is the best for system and application programmers. So they're not represented, of course, in the team at, at Oracle, um, but we have a mechanism where we can give feedback. And um, so the Oracle folks need us. Um, we all should be reading those Jepson project pages, try early builds, and give that feedback um, in great quantity. So when you do that, you know, it's easy in, uh, to say, well, this stuff with a million of fibers is, is clearly nonsense, but that's not the point. The payoff for Loom is the programming model. So as you examine this, see whether that programming model makes sense in your context and whether there is uh, a pain in, in moving for that. And so the analog that I would like to bring up is Java Util Stream. When first streams came out, there was a lot of saying that you know, the reason why streams are great is now you can just put in a dot parallel and out of sudden, all of your cores are busy. And that's of course not the case. Uh, and most of the times th that makes little sense and it's, it's not a great mechanism for parallelizing things. What really Java Util Stream gives us is a better programming model for the kinds of computations where you uh, need to aggregate data and you just wanna say what it is that you wanna have done without going into the nitty gritty how you wanna have it done. So that's a better programming model. And with Loom, it's kind of the same thing. Um, by having unity between tasks and virtual threads, um, by having uh, an easy way of uh, structuring your concurrent computations, you get a better programming model. So as you look at this with, with your own uh, <coughs> applications, remember that when you wanna influence the future of Java, data is gold. Anyone can bike shed and say, we like this, we don't like this. But if you have measurements, if you have experience, uh, reports, that's the kind of thing that they want to hear. All right, so that brings me to the end of the talk. And um, now, are there any questions? I unmute myself. Okay, so I'm back and uh, I have collected a few questions over the um, uh, the course of the presentation. So let me just run through them. Uh, I will click on them. They should pop up in the stream. So let's go back to this initial question uh, here, um, which was about uh, deadlocking. So let me pick it up. Uh, well, for some reason I don't have it, but yeah, I don't know why, but uh, 
Uh, yeah, the question was from um, <clears throat> how does Loom solve the deadlock problems in general? Yeah, so of course, Loom does not do anything to solve the deadlock problem, but the question is, why are you deadlocking? So if you split up your work into a bunch of concurrent tasks and each of them goes off and does its own thing, um, and then it comes back with some results, and then you combine all the results, there is no reason to deadlock. So Loom does not solve uh, bad concurrency habits. If you go and lock on some data structure, um, and at the same time, you know, someone else has to uh, wait. I mean, that's, that's just not going to happen. But that, that, does that really happen a lot in normal kind of uh, application level program? So Loom is really meant for the application level programmer, for the fellow who writes uh, a web application. And there, what do you do? I mean, you go out, you call a service, and you're not really going to create deadlocks in, in that scenario. But if you do something with deadlocks, hey, Loom can deadlock just as well as, as without Loom. Right. Um, another question is this one here. Uh, let's see. Random guy asks, I hope you guys see it. From which JDK onwards Loom is supported? Ha! Um, there's no way of knowing right now, right? I mean, certainly not JDK 17. Um, maybe JDK 23. Um, I mean, that, that would be, uh, I mean, look, we're looking at the long-term releases, right? Um, I mean, at some point, you know, let's say that 23 is the one that comes out. Then, you know, sometime 18, 19, 20, we'll see it. But, you know, it could be that it's only 27. There's no promise. Yes. <laughs> Another question is, uh, um, uh, this one here, um, it would be interesting to know how the problem with threat starvation is handled by Loom. Well, I guess threat starvation would mean that um, you have all of your threads lock on some, something and with Loom, that's just not going to be the case, right? You, so, so what if a bunch of threads uh, lock? They're virtual threads, and there's always more real threads that can do work. Yeah. Um, a follow-up question would be, uh, are there any optimizations needed for specific hardware platform or JVMs? Oh, I, I would not know. Uh, that uh, right now performance is still a work in progress, right? It's it's uh, there's some expense when um, you uh, you park a thread. You, know, you have to you have to save it stack. It's not, it's not totally cheap, and then bring the next uh, uh, virtual thread onto the carrier thread. You have to you know, activate the stack again. Um, you know, I'm sure that uh, at some point, you know, some architecture could come along that makes that more performant, but um, th that's definitely work in progress. We have another question here. Uh, this one, uh, I'm pretty new about uh, reading about Loom. Uh, is Project Loom something that could replace or be another solution to RX Java projects? Um, well, it's it, it would be an, uh, something that lets you not worry about RX Java, right? The reason you use RX Java is that you you want to program reactive so that your program never blocks. Right, you, you do something, you, uh, you say when that is done, then you'll do the next thing. And Rx Java gives you a way of, of managing that. And so Loom says, uh, you know, do you really want to do that? And for some, particularly for easy applications, um, Loom says the answer is no, just let it block. More coming, um, there's a... Uh... This question here, uh, which you probably have um, logged in, in your attempt to create a million virtual threads. How many real threads would actually be created by the million fiber examples? Um, eight. Yeah, in general, the number of cores. Yeah. No. Um, and this one is also is interesting. Uh, it's uh, how far will Loom make NIO obsolete? 
Oh, I don't think it'll make NIO obsolete. I mean, NIO is an important technology f under the hood, but really, uh, how many application programmers use NIO? I mean, was, yeah, you use like uh, NIO files, right? That's just the, the file API. But uh, how many of them really use selectors? I mean, that's uh, it's it's not something that an application level programmer typically faces. So uh, maybe one way of looking at it is like Loom is to uh, I IO streams as uh, you know Java util concurrent is to NIO. Yeah, if I can add to this, I also don't see NIO going away uh, pretty soon. It's it's a programming model that could coexist with a blocking programming model. And um, yeah, they both have yeah. their usages. Yeah, I mean, for, for people like you, I mean, you're going to have to, to, to well, use this, right? Yeah, well, there was an internal discussion for Jetty uh, where we were saying, well, maybe you know, Jetty next next is going to be totally rewritten without using NIO and just going server channel and blocking mode, and that's it because Loom does all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. um, that would simplify the server. Like, oof, it will yeah. probably be less than a than a fourth of the code that it is now. But but yeah, which is to your uh, you know, major point about Loom. It's not about the threads, and not, it's not about the millions, it's about the programming model. It's yeah. blocking simple API that, however, can scale, don't block threads. Yeah. So yeah, that's, um, yeah, we'll see. That's, <laughs> that's my, my yeah. comment on this. Um, Another uh, another comment would uh, is another question is this one uh, also related to NIO. Would Project Loom allow for event loop implementations to be reviewed? That's okay. Yep, maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, as I was talking with Kai, is more Loom is probably more another tool in your tool set you use it when the use case is a good Loom use case, but for other use cases, you may not want to use Loom. So maybe for other use cases, you actually want to go back to event loop or synchronous API or whatever, so. Yeah. And I don't think that the Loom team makes a claim that says uh, this is the one and only. Wait, they they just want to say, you know, in the case that, uh, that the kind of async programming that application programmers have to do now, if that is too much of a pain, it is it is a better way. Yes. Uh, another question is, uh, should we use volatile modifier or thread safe data structure uh, to pass data between virtual threads? Well, uh, I mean, it's always, be the, the less you share, the better, right? And so, I mean, ideally, none of these sh uh, threads share anything and they, they all Independently compute something, and then it gets uh, handed off to the to the parent and combined. That's the ideal situation. If you must share something, yeah, you better use a thread-safe data structure. Um, I would not recommend for ninety-nine percent of the people to even touch volatile. I mean, why uh, why would an application programmer run into this? I mean, if you really need need a counter, okay, use uh, use an atomic, but in most cases. Concurrent hash map or something like that is your friend. Yeah. Um, uh, well, there's a there's a, a number of, of um, uh, enjoyable presentations and positive comment which I skipped because they're not really questions. But they, there's very good feedback, uh, Kai. Um, there's another question uh, which is: uh, Is Loom supposed to introduce channel instead of blocking queue? Uh, I'm not sure. No, no. I mean, blocking queue is a perfectly good way of uh, of having uh, thread communication, right? It gives you a good way of, of throttling. Um, the contrary, blocking queue is is Loom's friend, right? Because blocking is cheap. Exactly. Especially if you have, um, you know, a bounded blocking queue. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, Fill the queue, and then you you have to block, but Loom is block friendly. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a uh, people can understand a blocking queue, 
right? You put in stuff, uh, it, it has a finite capacity, and you take take things out. It's something that people can reason about. Uh, that was the last question that came in, so uh, I think uh, uh, we can call it a wrap. <laughs> okay. And um, thanks, Kai, for your uh, time and for the presentations. Um, well, you know the streaming will be available on the YouTube channel. And uh, thank again. And let's see you on the, another session. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, so 